Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello and welcome back to Fighting on Film. This week, taking a look at an actually good film. Rob made me say that. If you listened to Throw our... Throw in the uh, bus early doors. Jesus. <laughs> if you joined us during December for 30 days in December, you know that the last film we covered was uh, was a bit, of a, a bit of a mess. But this time we are back with one of those classic 1950s British war films, Sea of Sand, also known as Desert Patrol in the US, premiered in 1958. And it has a very, very solid British cast and a really interesting premise. So your couple of sentence premise is that a long-range desert patrol is tasked with blowing up a German fuel dump behind enemy lines on the eve of the Battle of Val Enemain. Yeah, we finally get we get a film that's about long-range desert group. And there's not many. No. This might be the only one. Yeah, is that there another one? There might no, I think it I, mm. there's play dirty. Yeah. There's some that sort of suggest there about the SAS and Long Range Desert Raid Group. Raid on Rommel. But they don't make it super clear. Well, this is definitely Long Range Desert Group because it's talked about they're wearing unit flashes. They're on the, the Chevys with the machine guns. They're going behind enemy lines. You know, it's men against the desert, but then it's obviously a war film as well. It's just a solid little film, isn't it? Mm, I absolutely love it. This week, I'm covering production. So. The producers of the movie were Robert Baker and Monty Berman. They were Army Film and Photographic Unit members during the Second World War. And they went on to create Tempion Films, who later went on to get the rights to The Saint. So they were behind that. And the screenplays were written by Robert Westerby, but it was based on a uh, short story by a, a senior Army observer called Sean Fielding. So he wrote a 10-page like treatment, and then Westerby read it and then they adapted it and wrote on upon it to become this movie and it's directed by guy green now he has a chock full you know back catalog of what he worked on and he cut his teeth as a cinematographer before he directed yeah he got an oscar for the great great expectations he was a cinematographer on which we serve and he was also a cinematographer on the way ahead and hornblower he was got a backstory there which one day we might cover Yes, we will very soon if the Patreons are to have their way. That's a great time to, to let everyone know that if you'd like to vote on, on films that we cover on the podcast, each month we put up a, a few choices for our supporting cast to vote upon. Yeah. So if you would like to get involved with that, do check out our Patreon page. And Hornblower has, for the last few months, been one of the choices that I keep putting in and it keeps losing. But I think I think it's finally going to win. I think it might just, it might just come yeah. out, get Everyone's over Everyone's taking line, pity so. on me at this point and gone, <laughs> yeah. we need to give Matt this one. I think they have. This movie is shot entirely on location in Libya, Tripolitiana, to be precise. I think I pronounced that right. I have no idea how that's pronounced. And I was thinking this, it, Trip I know it's Tripoli. Yes, but I was so, going for the long, the classic yeah. produ- pronunciation there. Well, you can you can leave that in. That's fine. I'm going to leave it in. Uh, production was helped by the War Office. Um, they were given assistance from the 1st Battalion, the King's Rifle Corps and the Signal Corps. Michael Craig said of the production, we drank far too much, slept too little, and misbehaved in every possible way. Kind of keeping it in the uh, Long Range Desert Group vibe, you know, with them being unruly bunch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it makes sense. And the technical advisor was LRDG, Bill Kennedy Shaw. Yeah, he was the nav officer and the intelligence officer, wasn't he? Mm. So it has a real affinity with the actual unit itself. Um, and the film ends up getting two nominations at the 59 BAFTAs, Michael Craig for Best British Actor and the movie itself for Best British Film. It doesn't win. Um, Michael Craig is beaten out by Trevor Howard. No shame. No shame. No there. shame in that. And Room at the Top won Best British Film. And I have a retro review this week as well. It's interesting that you mention uh, Bill Kennedy Shaw, though, because he wrote the first unit history for Long Range Desert Group in, in 1945. So it's like one of the very first mm. wave of unit histories. He's the man for this, isn't he, really? But what did they think of it in uh, in the papers, Rob? Yeah, so this one comes from the Hammersmith and Shepherd's Bush Gazette on Friday, November 14th, 1958. And it says, just another war film, not Sea of Sand. It's a pity that Sea of Sand follows Naked and Dead by only a fortnight, 
People don't like to see too many war films too often, but Sea of Sand, made by the rank organisation, is a real cracker. It tells the story of a British detachment who operate behind Rommel's lines in the desert. It combines authenticity with artistry. There's none of that taking Burma single-handed stuff. It's tight and tense <laughs> and in a quite stiff upper lip sort of way, terrific. Richard Attenborough, John Gregson and Michael Craig are the stars. They set off into the desert in trucks with the objective of destroying an enemy fuel dump just before the Great Alamein Offensive. This is much, much more than just another war film. Wow, little dig at uh, Objective Bama there. Yeah, which I thought was, you know, they're still, they're still not over it, even if they're not over which it. I thought was it's... quite funny. Wow, that's a good review. That's great. It is a great one. Matt, I understand you have cast for us this week. I do indeed. Top of the bill is uh, Michael Craig, who plays Captain Tim Cotton. And he's a, a long time, long range desert group officer. Craig had previously been in, in, t- in terms of war films, he'd been in Malta Story and he was in uh, The Silent Enemy, which came out the same year as this one, actually. Talk about putting out too many war films. Um, <laughs> that was the British uh, cinema industry in the, in the 50s. That's how it rolled. It really was. Second billing, I think, is uh, John Gregson, who is one of those synonymous uh, actors with, with 50s movies, not just war movies. Uh, but in general, so in terms of because we always like to to link it into what he, what war movies they've been in previously, he'd been in things like Angels One Five, um, he'd been in Above Us the Waves, uh, Battle of the River Plate, obviously as uh, Captain Bell, uh, I think yeah. the Exeter, I think uh, he was in The Longest Day. He had that great little uh, scene where he's the Padre uh, doing a dip for his communion set. That's it, um, yeah. And he was also uh, in uh, The Night of the Generals in 1967. The rest of the cast is, it's, it's notable. Uh, I mean, you've got Richard Attenborough for one. Um, this, is, this comes out in the same year that Dunkirk does too. And he's right. playing uh, Trooper Brody. He's, I think he's badged up as RTR. Yeah, he's ex-RTR, yeah. Yeah, and he's got, he's got a, a great little character with a little bit of backstory. And we'll talk about him more later on. We got a great turn from Percy Herbert, who is a stalwart of, of, of British war movies. I think this might be his one of his best performances. Oh, absolutely, personally. I completely agree. Um, he's given the most to do in this. Yes. I think of, of a lot of his roles, he's not background. He's got a lot of interaction with Attenborough's character. They've got a nice repartee, and his scenes, you know, they have a bit of weight. So it, it, he's really great in this. And he's been in things like Cockleshell Heroes, uh, Bridge on the River Kwai. I mean, famously, he was a, a Japanese POW. Um, in Changi, where my granddad mm. was actually. Oh wow! Uh, a, a Hill in Korea, Yesterday's Enemy, The Guns of Navarone, Guns of Patazi, Tobruk, Picture like the not Hero. In. I know, right? The Wild Geese, which he was criminally underused in, and Sea Wolves. Uh, sea wolves. Yeah, yeah. yeah, what a career! Honestly, if if Percy Herbert is in a war movie, then you know it's going to be good. Very true. That's basic. That's my rule of thumb. Uh, well, who else have we got? We've got Barry Foster. Uh, as Corporal Matheson, who's uh, a sapper. Um, he was in the Yangtze incident uh, the year before. Um, and he was also in Dunkirk as well. I, I should also note that he was also in Battle of the River Plate. So mm-hmm. he's got a nice little link to Gregson. And there's a couple of guys in this film which were also in Battle of the River Plate as well. Um, he was also in Battle of Britain. And, and he was uh, a bit of a shit in The Wild Geese. And he was, uh, uh, I think he was the... The middleman, the intelligence officer, sort of hires the chaps in Wild Geese. Then we've got Vincent Ball as Sergeant Nesbitt, uh, Andrew Folds as Sergeant Parker, uh, George uh, Marcel as Corporal Sims, also in Battle of River Plate, and here is a telemark. Uh, Ray McNally as Sergeant Hardy. He was in Billy Budd in 1962, which is a you know, Revolutionary Wars naval adventure. Right. I know him best as being Harry Peacock. From uh, in, very, very British coup. coup, he's great in that. I it's love weird that. to see him looking so young in, in something. It is a little bit, isn't it? Uh, then we got Harold Goodwin as uh, uh, one of the Road Watch guys. So that's a very important job that the uh, LRDG did. They uh, monitored uh, MSRs and, and looked at German traffic and comings and goings and stuff. Which I really love the inclusion of that into this film, actually. Mm. And uh, he was uh, Guy Gibson's Batman in Dumbusters. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he he was he was in a lot of movies. Um, Goodwin, he was in uh, River Kwai, Longest Day, Angels One Five. So we've got these 
solid British character actors who you recognise the face of yeah. because they pop up in so many of these films. There's so much pedigree here, isn't there? There's so much. And then our Germans, our German cast, Rob, which we don't really get to see a lot of. They just sort of stand up in the back of half tracks and shout, don't they? Yeah, they do. Well, we get, we've got Wolf Fries as a, a German sergeant and he was in The Man Who Never Was, Steel Bayonet, Guns of Navarone, Operation Crossbow. He was a telemark, Zeppelin. Uh, similarly, we have George Mickle, who was a German officer, and he was a German character in films, including the one that got away again, Guns of Never Own, uh, Password is Courage with Dead Bogard, uh, Mystery Submarine, The Great Escape, Operation Crossbow again, so Attack on the Iron Coast, Zeppelin again, oh my uh, God. and Sea Wolves. He, wow. was, um, he was the Escape to Victory camp commander as well. Amazing. Yeah, so there's lots of really cool little little uh, links between all these films but yeah that basically rounds out the cast it's that classic 50, British 50s movie a uh, war movie where it's just this, the cast is either already established stars or they go on to have like amazing careers like Barry Foster goes on to be Van der Volk yep it is it's a bit of a golden era for, for sure um, definite golden not era. only for war movies but British cinema as a whole that it's like that post-war boom isn't it Exactly. And then we get that resurgence in the 60s. And a lot of them carry over, like Percy Herbert and some of the other guys. They continue to like appear in, in these like meaty character actor roles where they get to do a really good job of, of being that supporting cast. Yeah. Talking of that golden era, actually, I read a bit from a little bit of a journal written by John Ramson, and it's called Refocusing the People's War, British War Films of the 1950s. And it says... Right. The Dan Busters certainly created the push towards combat films in the second half of the decade. Producers were constantly referring back to his earlier successes as proof of what the public wanted, so as to justify the decisions about later productions. Interviewed in 1958, Monty Berman, the producer of Sea of Sand, directed by Guy Green, himself a former member of the Long Range Desert Group, said, look at the newspapers or the new book titles in shops. A good story of the war is always popular. It seems that that held true for... A long time in the UK, especially into the 60s, war, war movies remained box office. That 50s, 60s peak is definitely absolutely fascinating, I think. And it just shows it shows them, the, you know, you look at the amount of movies we get out of this period, like Dan Busters, River Choir, Crawl Sea, Take Your Pick. They're just all, yeah. yeah, they're all absolute classics of the genre. And I think Sea of Sand gets forgotten about a little bit. I don't know whether it's yeah, it because does a little bit. Mm. Vice Cold and Alex comes out before, it's where it comes out the same year. I'm not sure whether that affects it and then you've got dunkirk as well of course dunkirk that yeah. exact same year so maybe sea of sand is maybe the forgotten gem i don't know so before we head into the alley tally uh, i suppose we, we should give a little bit more depth on what the film's actually about so it's set just before the battle of um the second battle of uh, el almain which rob mentioned it's kind of based i think on operation caravan which was the raid on uh bass which right. saw um a couple of LRDG patrols penetrate about 1,200 miles behind enemy lines, which is, which to me sounds insane. 1,200 yes. miles. That's it's staggering, really. Um, you know, on, on jeeps and trucks over desert that people thought couldn't be, you know, traversed. Yep. And I think this film does quite a good job of getting that across, you know, the difficulties they faced and, it does some of the little intricacies really well. You know, it talks about how they navigate by stars and you know, they, how they position and dead reckoning and such really yeah. interesting little little tidbits that have been fed in. And I like how John Gregson is used as your fish out of water. So mm. the movie can show you how the LIG operate without making it look forced. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He's there for exposition, isn't he? Um, uh, Craig's character, uh, Captain Cotton, explains you know how things yeah. work, and they show the difference obviously between the regular army and these LRDG specialist troops. So there's a great, there's some great dialogue in this movie. I think the dialogue for me is one of the things I absolutely loved about it. And it's uh, you know he says, "Oh, you won't find us terribly regimental here." And he asks his one of his COs asks Collins how he feels about the new the new chap. And he goes, our oh, typical soldier, if he was dying of thirst, he'd use his last water to blanco his belt. That's a brilliant line. That was So good. That stood out to me as well. And yeah, so Gregson's character is a, uh, he's a sapper, he's a rural engineer captain. Uh, apparently he's done the staff corps 
course as well, um, which gets hinted at. And he's a career soldier, been in for a few years. Um, and he's he's stiff up a lip, isn't he? He's by the book. And yeah. that clashes a little bit with Craig's character. So his, his role in the film is to uh, get the patrol through a minefield, which is protecting a fuel dump. Craig's character explains that uh, last time we tried to get through to that fuel dump, uh, we couldn't because of the mines. And it's uh, Gregson's character's job to use the brand new metal detectors that they've got, which is a great little scene, um, to get through the uh, the minefield and allow them to sneak in, set up some charges, and then sneak out again. So they have to traverse. I think in the film it's mentioned by about 900 miles behind enemy lines, evading scout planes, German patrols, etc., and finally, they make their attack. Little by little, they get sort of... Uh, they get whittled down. They do. That was the word yeah. I was looking for. Throughout, they get whittled down. They lose a, a truck here. You know, They lose a truck there. And at the end, they're down to their last truck. And there's a little bit of spice added to it because they discover something that they didn't expect to discover at the, uh, the fuel dump. And it's a couple of squadrons of tanks that they didn't know about. Yes. So that adds a little bit of weight to them having to get back. So if that hadn't have been added to the storyline, it would have just been them trying to escape and it wouldn't have really mattered to the war and the grander scheme, you know? But because they need to get back and warn uh, command and get the RAF to bomb these uh, these couple of squadrons of, of Africa Corps uh, tanks that are they're hidden, because they, they couldn't possibly have brought enough explosive to destroy no. you know, the tanks as well. Um so that adds a little bit of weight and importance to them getting back uh, to to get you know that that warning off. Yeah, that it's a simple film, nothing too mm-hmm. um, complex. It's, it's a very straightforward ABC, plot. isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but I it's like not that. De- not a detriment yeah. to it at all. No, no. Um, and there's some great performances along the way which keep it interesting. And you know, what also keeps it interesting, Rob. The amount of Ali Kit in the film. There is an incredible amount of Ali Kit in this movie. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. The first Ali Tally of the year, Matt. Kick us off. Absolutely. So when we think Long Range Desert Group, what do you think, Rob? Well, I think of, of lads uh, in uh, Chevy trucks, heavily armed, really nice amount of stowage. You know, Tools. Of, tooled up. Yeah. Yeah. With, yeah. With their um, is it ke- kefir? Traditional, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. The you know with the like the sat the scarves, scarves on over their heads. You know, wearing whatever the world whatever they want, pretty much. That's the I think. Yeah. yeah, and we get it, we get it, and I I really appreciate you know, the level of detail that they tried to get to with this. Mm. Obviously, there were some limitations with where they were and what they could get their hands on. But as you say, at the beginning of the of the episode, you were you were talking about how they were supported by. British Army in Libya, and, and that shows because we get some nice Vickers gun action, don't we? A lot, quite early on as well. It, yeah, yeah. I, the opening, that opening set piece with the the armor fighting vehicle is is pretty good. Very good. Um, I didn't know that Vickers guns fired armor piercing incendiary rounds to to knock out that armored vehicle, but we'll let them off. Could they have had tracer? Would that have helped? Yeah, they, they might have hit a petrol can stowed on the back of it, perhaps. I thought that as well, because I was like, hang on a minute, how are they taking this a- AFV out? Yeah, they're, but, they're pounding it like it's a 20 mil cannon, but it's, it's yeah, just a Vickers gun. But with the amount of, the sheer amount of Vickers guns, there's like six trucks in the troop, isn't there? So yeah, before the, the, the AFV attacks them. So surely that amount of Vickers guns putting that amount of fire down is going to damage it eventually maybe not blow it up but it's going to put it out of action yeah if you if you're getting some lucky shots into the cabin through the the, the open vision slit then yeah that's all good too that's what i thought happened <laughs> Ex- yeah exactly so we've got we've got some great vickers gun action which which is good but it's kind of not entirely correct because when you look at photographs of the lrdg you don't see a lot of vickers guns on there there are some um but you more commonly see uh twin vickers k mounts for that, you know, that high rate of fire. Yeah. Um, Lewis guns, even some Browning 50 cal, like 0.5 inch. Not easy to get hold of though. So no, you gotta let you gotta let th- something slide. Yeah, of course. I know for the production that the the production team 
bought some civilian Chevrolet and Dodge trucks and converted them to look more like LRDG ones. So I yeah, know the three tonners. The three tonners, yeah. So there is a you know there is a Chevrolet variant there. There's a Dodge one that looks very similar. You know, unless you're really a, a you know truck aficionado, mm-hmm. can't really tell the difference in some shots. Um, there's a Bedford MW, which was really nice to see because I've been deprived of Bedford's for nearly two you months. Have. There's been a, a lack over the last month, hasn't there? I did that thing, you know, DiCaprio in uh, Once Upon a Time, that, that gif, you know, the Whoop! point, <laughs> the point gif. Yeah. yeah. It was like me yeah. with the MW. The Jerry's use uh, M5 half tracks as their half tracks. It's pretty common in most. Yes. Yeah, and is it M3, M3 ones? M5 half track this time. Oh, okay. I, 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 not not a US half track expert, obviously, but yeah, standing in for SD two five ones. Um, yeah, all armed with Bren guns, no MG thirty yeah. fours. <laughs> you can't hide the Bren. You, no. you can't mock a Bren up they, to look nothing like they a Bren, do. Can they you? do try and hide the Bren by putting what appears to be a tube over the barrel, um, to give it sort of a um, non characteristic look. Yeah, but there's a scene where one of the one of the Germans on the back of the uh, the half track is firing it. And the tube is is rattling off. It's like the camera cuts away mm. before it actually because I thought it was a blank adapter off the barrel. Yeah, I was, and it, yeah. So it's just not. I thought it was a blank adapter, but no. Yeah, wasn't. I think the Brens are running blank adapters. Um, speaking of which, the the Vickers um, is running a service pattern blank adapter, Ooh. and you can tell that by the um, the little nut that projects out the front of the the muzzle comb. That makes sense because they're basically firing it overheads, at, you know, at some points, and yeah. It's a little bit safer. Um, of course, yeah. There are, there are other types of, of blank tap that would let a little bit more gas out of the barrel, which are a little bit less, you know, a little bit less safe for that confined space. So when they're swinging it around over the top of Richard Amber's head, you know, this kind of makes a little bit more, bit of sense. I also think the Vickers drills are quite good too, from what I remember. Yeah, so there's a little bit um, where Matheson, this one of the sappers, is uh, in that first engagement, and he. He has a jam and he has a stoppage and he panics and he, he's like, yeah, I've got a stoppage. And he, he's, he just sort of freezes and doesn't know how to clear the stoppage. And and Captain Cotton, um, uh, Craig's character, jumps on the bickers, opens up the top cover. Obviously, I think he was, I, if Rich was here, he'd know exactly what kind of stoppage he was clearing. Oh, yeah, Rich would know 100%. Yeah. But perhaps when we get Rich on for Vickers Guns in film, um, which which I hope he does with us. That'd be so fun. <laughs> That'd be a great one, actually. <laughs> uh, we can we can talk about the scene again. But yeah, so he he clears this stoppage and, and lets rip on the half track as it passes again. Um, but the Vickers action in this is great, and it's it. We'll come back to it again with my my favorite scene. I think. Yeah, it's, it, but, I know I know exactly the scene you're going to talk about. It's my favorite scene too. So did did anything else stand out for you, Rob? Just what the lads are wearing is is really quite well researched, and, and that's probably Bill Kennedy's. Um, Bill Kennedy Shaw's input. Mm. You know, they've got their. You see pictures of the LRDG. It's all a regular kit. You like know, the goat the skins def- and stuff. Goat skin jackets. Yeah, they are the definition of alley, really, aren't they? If you think about it. Yeah. So you know, they've all got different headdress on. You know, there's an Australian character. He's got like a sort of junk, like a. Oh, is it like a, a slouch hat? Yeah. Slouch hat. Yeah. Um, Brody's wearing his RTR beret. You've got um, McNally's characters wearing his Coldstream Guards. Uh, stiff cat. I love the bit where I love a bit where McNally tells um, Brody to straighten the cat badge. Yeah, <laughs> as if it matters. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Attenborough has another one of those brilliant lines where he's like, well, that, "That's going to take six months off the wall." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's great. It's brilliant. But yeah, it's just nice to see like cat comforters, different mix of whipping. You know, it all feels very authentic. The the as we said, the military involvement in the production of the movie really shines through um, with mm. the kit and. The only thing that is sort of annoying to me, but it's only because I know this tiny little nitpicky thing, is the small arms that are in it. So we get Mark III Sten's number four mm-hmm. rifles and Brent's. Mm-hmm. So it's not wrong, but the LRDD, LRDG didn't have those. They had Thompson's. They used number threes. They did. So it's a little bit annoying, but because of the obviously the army involvement, they're probably just get, using weapons. It's they what they can get hold of, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, no one had Stens. Definitely not no. Mark Threes because they didn't come out until 43. No, of course. Um uh so no no one had those in, in North Africa until until uh there are actually some photographs of um naval shore parties training uh in Egypt with Mark twos. Um 
done a video on that actually. Armorsbench.com. <laughs> exactly. They have these really interesting wooden foregrips on. Anyway, yes. but yeah, they they definitely wouldn't have had stens, and the Germans that have stens definitely wouldn't have had stens. Um, they they don't even do a thing where I think it's so easy in movies. Just turn it sideways to fire it. Well, the thing is with the Sten Mark II, if they had a Sten Mark II, you can actually turn the magazine housing 90 yeah. degrees clockwise because they were designed for stowage that way. It's just so one if of those you, things. If you could do that, you could have, you know, for the just the st- centuries yeah. like standing there, they could have done that, but they never do. It stands out too much. <laughs> it's just a it little, it's one of those small things. One of the things that they do get right is uh, Cotton has, uh, at one point, I think just after the raid, he has a Lend-Lease uh, Smith & Wesson M&P Victory. Revolver. Well, I'm glad you spotted that. I was wondering what that revolver was. Yeah, yeah. I, that, you can just make it out. In, it's this some of those really nicely shot day-for-night sequences, yeah. which work really well. That's some of the best day-for-night. I was just about to say, they are some of the best day-for-night I've seen so far doing um, the show. I'm not surprised, considering you've got Guy Green as the as the director and and uh, Wilkie Cooper is the, the cinematographer, both very, yes. very capable cinematographers. Very um, my other alley pick, because there is another, um, has to be The Mind Detector. I was just about to say that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a shared alley pick then. Have you got what it is in your notes too? <laughs> I have. Go ahead, Rob. Enlighten us all. For you Mind Detector aficionados out there, it is a number four A set. <laughs> there we go. That's what Matheson and Captain Williams' character characters are there for. They're there to clear those minds. And they've brought with them the latest kit, number four A mind detector set. And they yeah. they do a great job. And it there's a nice little scene um of them. And you can hear in in uh, Matheson's headphones the beeping of the of the tones for the it's minds. Really well when shot you find scene. It's really it is intense. Yeah. It's one of the best minefield scenes. Yeah. For me, that's it. I mean, the other thing we should probably say, we should probably, I was going to mention in my final thoughts, but I mention it now. I think the desert is its own character as well in the movie. Surely, yeah, I, that's that's fair to say. I think the fact that it's it's shot on location in Libya and you can feel the cold at the night and the heat of the day. You you can almost you can almost feel the heat coming off that jerry can when they're cooking those sausages. And you, yeah, it, it's so beautifully shot where the, you know there's the grease. And then they just kick. They just kick the jerry yeah, can over. Like, it's it's that. It's the little things that really make this movie. You know that yeah. even down to when oh come on, we got to go, they knock the they knock their fire that they've made out over, and then a guy kicks over all the the cinders. They fill it in. So if someone comes across it, they they're not going to know there was a patrol there. Yeah, it's yeah. really little tiny little things. Really nice. Nice little detail. Yeah, Percy Herbert's little navigating compass right at the start. So mm. the little things that the, the the LRDG would need for for you know being in the desert is really good, but absolutely. And on the dash of all the trucks, they have the the day reckoning. Um, yeah, little compasses, don't they? Really nice, because it isn't studio bound. You can get these beautiful, really long shots of men trekking through the desert, or you know trucks coming over the horizon. It, you you just get a different level of cinematography that you wouldn't get if it's studio bound or if it was model bound. There's no model work in this movie at all. And it is, it's a real treat for the war movie fan in every one of us, you know? It's like a real treat of a film, I think. No, I agree. I, well, that end sequence where there's uh, the German half-track is pursuing them and there's, yeah. a, there's another LRDG truck driving past they need to get its attention. The panning shot that they do there, you get that sense of scale. It's great. It's, of, it's, the it's in two it's... valleys and they can't contact them without letting the Germans know where they are. So mm. that illustrates the dilemma they have really beautifully. So, should we move on to favourite scenes? I think we should. Hello, I'm Al Murray, and you're listening to Fighting on Film, the world's number one war film podcast. So I think this week, Matt, I think we might agree on a favourite scene for the first time ever. Well, is it the I first time? I think so. I can't remember if it's the first time. Well, we're 57 episodes in now, so I don't know, yeah. but... Any Foth um, super fans, let us know if we've agreed before. <laughs> but I think honestly, this scene is is one of the the more powerful from the film, and it stands out, doesn't it? So yeah, go ahead and 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 run us through it, Rob, and then we'll we'll chat about. It. So after the minefield sequence where they discover the squadron of tanks, they're trying to get back, and it all seems to be going okay. They're you know they're going to drive back, going to let the the Allied command know that these tanks are there, but then they get spotted by some half tracks. 
and they get absolutely shot up. Um, there's no petrol left. Percy Herbert gets wounded. It's all looking a bit bad, basically. It's so dicey, isn't it? Very dicey, you know. So, and, and at this point, you know, Collins and Gregson are sort of on the same page now. They're, they're sort mm. of, they're not, you know. They to appreciate each other's um, skills and where they're coming from. They band together, basically, as, as commanders. So Gregson says, you know, we're going to have to walk. We have to get back. It's 40 miles. Come on. So Herbert just looks That's up. That's nothing compared to what they've just had to go through. Is <laughs> exactly, it, yeah, yeah. So Herbert looks up and he goes, count me out, Skip. Brody, Rich Dattenberg is very upset by this. He goes, oh, I'll, yeah. don't worry, we, you know, I'll carry you. And um, Greg says, there's no, we can't know, there's no dead weight, basically. Yeah. So um, Percy says, oh, well, leave me here. Leave me with a gun and I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll slow them down if they, if they find me. Yeah. Brody gets upset. He's like, no, I'll stay with him. Gregson officers not having any of it. So they build um Percy Herbert this little fire pit to yeah. have his lot to have I've written in my notes Herbert's last stand. It is, it is. They yeah. they dig him in with a uh, camouflage net, leave him the radio, dick it out and relieves him his brandy. Right water. Um yeah. and they set him up with Vickers gun. He waits for the for the half tracks to come over and he he lets rip. He does. And he, he knocks off the, the Vickers as well, which I... He does. It gives it a taps. I love to see that. He was Royal Army Ordnance Corps, so he, he he probably would have, you know, been trained on, yeah. on Vickers and, oh, it's very and had a bit of experience. Yeah, he does. He he, he knocks it off and then he, he puts his forefingers over the cross piece, which yes. is correct. And he fires in controlled bursts, which is he does. absolutely gorgeous. Mwah, Seth's kiss, Herbert. And I, I think what gives that scene the weight is the relationship that he and Attenborough uh, evolve mm. throughout the film we find out that he's got kids at home family yeah big family he sticks to the rules he but he um he, he kind of appreciates um the cheekiness of of Attenborough's character Brody yeah uh he, he doesn't he doesn't take the brandy when he's offered it you know earlier on in the film because it's against regulations and he says look you'll be caught master if they find you with that yeah mm. yeah they're always joking about uh Brody ended up in the in the glass house yeah at the prison it's the culmination of of that relationship, and it's two very good actors in that mm. scene, and it it adds weight to the film. Of course, it's one of those tropes. It's a last stand. Leave me here. I'll I'll hold them off. Kind of yeah. trope, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But, but it's, it's done, done very it's well. Done well. Yeah. It's not just the you know the scene where he makes his last where he actually gets attacked, but it's the small things that I really like. So he gets given the radio, and he turns it on. He undoes his belt, be more comfortable. He's you can tell he's dying. And he turns the radio on and it's gardener's question time. It's the first like comfort of home. And it's complete, it's complete juxtaposed to everything else we've heard in the movie. This is a nice little cameo of Dickie Attenborough's actual speaking voice, where we have Mrs. Collins. She chose this, uh, this Vivalin track, What a Day We'll Have. And that plays. The Germans have shot him up by this point, and the radio gets kicked by the Jerry. Jerry officer. Oh, I love the cinematography of that. Yeah. And you get the, the hum of the radio being kicked and the, it's like a, a quick turn to the picture of his family. Yeah. And, and he's fades. propped up on the, the Vickers guns tripod. Yeah. And it, and it fades out and it's just, it's just one of those great little pieces of cinematography that you just really, really appreciate like a lot. Mm -hmm. It's just all, it's all you need. You don't need anything else. It's, it's like he died thinking about his family. It's actually quite sad when you think about it really. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a really it's a emotional. powerful scene. Yeah, it is. It's it, it's so easy for war films not to include things like that, or alternatively, and almost worse, to go too ham with them. But we aren't beating over the head that he's a family man. No. It's dropped into the into the discourse within the film, um, and you gain you you come to like the character. It sets it up really well, so you feel for him when he's in this situation. He's got the most to lose as well. That's another trope. He does, and that comes about again later on, doesn't it? With with Gregson's character's death, and he's a you know father of four, and and Captain Cotton, uh, Craig's character, literally shouts, he, "He was the one with the most to live for." Yeah, it's really tropey, but it's well, it is, and but it kind of works because there's subtle hints throughout the film that that his marriage hasn't worked because Gregson finds a ripped up photograph of his yeah, of his yeah. wife, etc. He talks about women finding comfort with men close to home mm. uh it's a casualty of war he talks about and it, there's some really great dialogue about that and it's it sets the 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 relationship between the two of them up where you not only have that 
by the book officer clashing with someone who's a civilian thrust into the war in this unit, which is completely irregular, you know, from the rest of the army, has its own methods, ways. And by the end of that film, as you said earlier, they've come to appreciate one another. So when when Gregson runs forward with the Sten gun to 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 get the attention of the Germans and and I'll let the rest of the group get the attention of the 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 passing patrol again adds weight it's not as quite as powerful as uh herbert's scene and death but it's still mm. it's still quite well set up um and there's there's a little bit of parallel there and then there's there's that concluding scene where uh, captain cotton's reporting into uh, uh the company commander he talks about little uh flags on maps marks on maps and yeah. the commander says well there's hundreds of marks on maps across hundreds of maps that's the war. We don't. We won't know what all this has been for until later. You know, once it's all come together, and then the film concludes with with Dickie Attenborough waking up to hear the the opening uh, monumental barrage of El Alamein, mm, and that's what nice. it's all been for. Yeah. Because you do feel like they've what they did was actually going to have a difference. It's interesting that they decided to fictionalize it a little bit and was that operation they were actually on, uh, Operation Caravan, they were attacking not only a fuel dump, but it's also one of those attacks where they they knocked out a lot of aircraft that were already on the ground. So they, they drove up and down, knocking out aircraft with with their machine guns. Oh, it's that raid, right? It's, yeah, yeah, it's okay. one of those ones. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that's just something they couldn't quite pull off with the budget they had, perhaps. Um that would have been probably something they would, they would have had to have relied on model work for, perhaps. Um, who knows? But I think the decision to go with just a straight fuel dump raid and the discovery of the tanks works really well. And it it links it links in nicely to prelude to El Alamein, I think. Yeah, it's nice. And, then, and obviously that's a battle that everyone who's going to that movie knows the importance of. So they know the importance yeah. of the mission to, for, for the chaps to get back is really important. So yeah, on a final thoughts territory now, I think, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think it's the small details that make this movie. So yep. the the way that the cinematography and the dialogue sets up the importance of water, fuel, um, the LRDG's attitude to the way that they operate is really mm. interesting. And we get little bits of that sprinkled in throughout, you know, uniform, weapons, kit, yeah. um, the, uh, the, what they do operationally in the desert. So Everyone helps pull out a truck when it gets bogged down, uh, that sort of thing. All for one mentality, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, they're all by first name, uh, which, again, surprises Gregson's character. Yep. Um, the discussion of navigation, I really like that. And then there's you know the, the little bits of setting up the characters. Amber is an orphan boy soldier. You know, he's been in for years, but he's a bit of a bit of a jack yeah. the lad still. Um, yeah, it's just a, a solid little late 50s British war movie, isn't it? I think it really is for me. I, you know, I really, really rate it. So I, I'd seen it years and years ago and I think I watched it again for the first time properly last New Year's. And every time I rewatch it, I'm just, I just really like it. It, it's, it always engages me. I think the dialogue is one of its key things. It gets banter between troops, like friends really well. You know, like the way that, mm. the way that Brody and Blanco are always having a bit of a, you know, like a one, one, two together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like he's he's like with the player cigarette scene where they're all taking the cigarettes and then Blanco doesn't get one. He goes, Oh, I'm okay with these, and they must be like locally made cigarettes that are very good. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Um and then oh, you know, he goes, You don't know what you know what they're putting them things, don't you, Blanco? And he goes, What? And then Brody goes, Oh, by the time the penny drops with him, he's got mildew on it. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I don't know whether it's it, it's because it's Attenborough delivering those lions, and I think Attenborough was a king of this sort of cheeky dialogue. I think he was an absolute one of the best at it um mm, mm. but i think it's really good that the dialogues for me is really great there's a scene where um is it mcnally and, and a couple of the other um cold stream guards lads they're saying that oh you know it's dangerous out here isn't it oh not as dangerous as being in in submarines my brother's in submarines and he goes oh you wouldn't catch me in a sub too dangerous and then it cuts to them handling explosives yes it does like, yeah there's yeah. some funny moments in there that make the movie but as you said, I think it's a really solid picture. It's one of the only LRDG films out there. Genuinely gripping at points as well. Mm. Even if I do know what happens, it still grips me every time with that mind 
minefield scene. I still think they're going to set a mine off. And like we said, it's just a very well handled little mine scene. Really great. It's well worth your time. It's and it's in that golden era of British war movies that we just seem to absolutely lap up whenever they're on. Yeah, the reaction to it on Twitter was uh, was was positive, wasn't it? When we really good. Let yeah, everyone really know good. that we were going to it this week. Mm. Um, so if you haven't followed us, we are at Fighting on Film uh, on Twitter. You can also find us on Facebook. And we have a website, fightingonfilm.com, and you can find out about all of the shows that we've done previously and what's coming up. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll catch you next week. Fingers crossed for Homeblow. Big fingers crossed. (laughs) See you next week, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.